Hi, if you're here joining us for our uh, CS Fundamentals workshop, we're going to start in one minute and we're going to learn about what's going on with CS Fundamentals this year. So um, stay tuned. And if you want to join the conversation, you can tweet us at Teach Code throughout the conversation. Um, we're going to be monitoring that and we'll be answering any questions you have if you tweet them at Teach Code. And hi, if, I'm just going to keep repeating myself because I don't know who's joining us. So if you're joining us, um, we're going to start in a, about 30 seconds. Um, welcome. And um, again, we're using Twitter for the conversation. So you can tweet us at Teach Code throughout the conversation. And we're going to um, answer your questions. OK, it looks like it's 4 o'clock. We're going to get started. Um, and I think, oh, yeah, here's Hadi. He's going to join us. So. Uh, We've got we've got Hadi. He's our um, founder and CEO. And um, uh -huh. hi everybody. I'm Alice. I am our chief product officer. And this is Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a product manager for our elementary school programs. Great. And so during this webinar, um, what we're going to be doing is uh, just giving you a little update on CS Fundamentals and what's happened. We're going to demo the new features that we've built over the summer, so you can see everything that you've got. Um, for back to school that you didn't have last year. And um, we're also going to show you some of the stuff that's upcoming. Uh, and again, if you just joined us, if you have any questions during the conversation, you can tweet them at Teach Code. Uh, and we're going to be answering your questions live as you guys tweet them at us. So, how do you want to kick things off? Sure. Uh, it's kind of awkward talking to just a camera <laughs> <with that. laughs> We're talking to at Teach Code. They can talk back to us just via Twitter. Well, if anybody's there, please tweet at Teach Code so we know that there's more than one of you. There's 32 um, viewers. You can see. Um, well, first, I just want to thank all the teachers who have uh, participated with you know, bringing computer science to classrooms in the last few years. It's just been incredible uh, to see the, the growth of demand and interest and excitement in computer science in the, in the three years that Code.org uh, first launched uh, our Code Studio platform. We are now at the point where 380,000 teachers have created accounts on Code Studio, uh, and 12 million students are have coded uh, on our platform. That's you know obviously the hour of code has been a huge driver of interest in computer science, uh, but Code Studio's growth has just been incredible to watch. At this point, uh, at least 15% of all students in America have accounts on our system, and uh, a pretty hefty, uh, roughly 10% of all teachers in America have accounts in our system, and that's just uh, incredible to think about for something that's only three years old. Uh, and really, that's thanks partly to the great work that our team does, but in large part to the word of mouth of teachers telling each other about the importance of computer science. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank all the teachers who've uh, embraced computer science in the last few years for your work. Uh, you know, the teacher-led movement to bring computer science to students has, uh, you know, it's, it's a worldwide movement, but in this country it is completely changing our education system at a, at a pace that nobody's ever seen before. Uh, and it's not because you know famous people are saying that you should learn CS, and it's not because important politicians are saying it. It's because teachers have decided that this is important. And so many teachers are doing it that the famous people and the politicians are, are coming around to it as well. Uh, as I'm sure you've seen, uh, this year President Obama basically decided that computer science is something that he wants to take up as one of the sort of his legacy goals for his uh, you know, for, for his last year of his administration, announcing a plan or at least a, a desire for every school to teach computer science. Uh, so it's it's exciting to see the work that we've done and really the work that teachers worldwide have embraced reach such a critical level of sort of, uh, I guess, critical mass to, to get to that level of sort of endorsement. Um, anyway, we've spent our summer making a whole lot of improvements to our courses and to our platform. So, you know, the main point of this webinar is to welcome teachers to the new year and to uh, to get a chance to look at some of the new things that the team has built. So uh, I think Alice will kick it off. Yeah, so I'm going to show you um, some of the new things that are already live that you can see now. Um, and then after I do that, Ryan is going to show some of the stuff that's upcoming that is um, that you can try now but isn't isn't live on the site yet. Um, so here is my screen. Go Hopefully you can all see if any of these ask questions. <laughs> okay. Um, so you can hopefully all see my screen. Um, if uh, you want to, 
it, it might not be the default because my sound's not on. Yeah, can you? Uh, okay, hold on. I'm gonna make my. How do I? I think she did it. Oh, you did it. So I'm now presenting to everyone. Okay. Well, is that just on our screen or is that for everybody? No, that's your screen. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah, hopefully you're seeing this um, computer science fundamentals back to school webinar. Um, again, you can tweet at, at Teach Code if you want to reach us. Uh, so we just had our update. Next thing we're talk about new features um, that we added for the 2016-27 school year. Um, so this is the features, and I'm going to give you a quick demo of each of these. Um, the first thing this happened late at the end of last year, um, but course four is now complete. So last year we were working on it. It was in beta the whole year, um, and so there were some changes being made. We've taken a ton of feedback um, based on your feedback during the beta phase, and if you look at um, course four now, you'll see that it's got all of those improvements. We've added hints. We've added more challenging puzzles because many of you told us um, in our survey, our annual survey, that you really wanted more challenges for some of the students in your class. You'll see that this course has those challenges. Um, course four is super hard. <laughs> course four gets hard. Uh, but you know, you've been asking us to make it hard. It's hard. So if you have kids who are getting bored, um, send them on to course four. Um, at the end of it, we've also added this special section. We've got super challenges on variables, super challenges on for loops, super challenge, and then extreme challenge. Um, so, you know, more and more and more challenges. Um, you'll also see if you go to the course, um, and this will be true of all of our course pages, um, we've updated so you've got these nice view lesson plan links over to the right for each of the courses. Um, and they were visible before, but a lot of people were missing them because it's this tiny little itty bitty link. So now I've got this big links to view lesson plan. Um, and we've also made it easier for you to switch with this teacher panel um, between a student view and a teacher view. So when you look at it, you're seeing it as a teacher, so you see the lesson plans. But when you have your screen up in front of the classroom, oftentimes you want to show the students where to click. You don't want you want your screen to look just like their screen. Um, so if I go to student view here, all of the special links for teacher panels and other things for teachers will disappear. Um, and my screen will look just like the student's screen. And I can go back to teacher view here, and I have all of my lesson plans. Um, so check out course four. Um, it's designed for students who have finished course three. Um, it's not supposed to be the starting point. So if your students uh, are, if you're just getting started, start with course two. If your students can read, um, start with course one if your students can't read. And when they finish course three, um, course four is now available. Next thing on the list um, is we've improved a bunch of teacher supports. Oh, I already shared the first one, which is the lesson plan links. Um, another thing we've done is add support for pair programming. Um, and this is, you know, I, we have uh, some videos and resources available online um, that I we can send. I think they're in the link we sent you about the school. Um, but one of the things that we found is that, and not just us, other people, is that when students work together, they learn in a different way than when they just work by themselves. And so. Um, something that you might want to try in your classroom is to, you know, if me and Ryan are here, that we can just, you know, pair together on the same computer. One of us is the driver, one of us is helping out in navigating, and then we'll switch, and you can be the driver and I can help navigate. Um, and that, you know, increases collaboration. It allows students to learn from each other, try to explain something to another student. Um, you learn in different ways than you do when you just try to solve the puzzles by yourself. It's also great in schools where you might not have one-to-one -one computers with student ratios. The problem that we had was that when we did that, we were either logged into my account or we were logged into Ryan's account. And so when the teachers were looking at the student progress, and here I've got the teacher dashboard up, um, they only saw the progress from the student who was logged in. Um, and it was hard to keep track of the fact that Ryan had also done these puzzles because he was sitting at the computer with me. Um, so now we've added the ability for students uh, to choose who they're, pair, who they're pair programming with and mark down for the teacher and for the student that they both completed that puzzle. So what I've got here, I'm going to switch windows here, uh, switch again. Okay, so um, I'm Lucas. I am logging in. I'm using my picture password. Um, and this is our normal login screen uh, if I'm using a uh, picture password. For those of you who don't recognize it, some kids will log in with email or word password. This works no matter how you log in, but here's picture password. Um, I'm going to pick my uh, password, which is the pirate. And there's a new checkbox here where I can say I have a partner at my computer. So that's the new thing. That's the new thing, is the partner at my computer. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in with my partner. And when I do that, it'll let me pick who I'm partnering with. And in most cases, it's one other person, but sometimes it'll you know three kids at a computer, so we let you pick three if, or two. Um, in this case, I'm going to work with Ryan. 
because sitting next to me. Um, or actually, let me work with Maddie and Ryan. Oh, just Maddie. Um, I'm going to add my partner. And let's go ahead and do um, this first puzzle here. Uh, and I'm going to try to get to that sunflower. And you'll notice that when I'm logged in with my team at the top right here, instead of just saying, hi, Lucas, it says, hi, team. At any point, I can come here and see who's logged in. I'm logged in with Lucas and Maddie. Um, and I could click that again to uh, log one of us out. But let's solve this puzzle. Move forward, move forward, move forward, and run. Totally did it. I ate that sunflower. Done. OK, now what you see here is that I've got my green dot showing that I finished that level. Um, but when I go back to the teacher view, my teacher view. Um, so that was stage two maze, and I was Lucas and Maddie. This was before they did it. I'm going to refresh and see what happened now. And let's go back into stage two to look at the progress on stage two. Um, and here you can see that as a teacher, I can see that both Lucas and Maddie um, completed this puzzle. And I can zoom in on it uh, by clicking on it to see one of their answers. And when I do that, I can see that I'm looking at Lucas's answer, but that he has this little pair programming icon, and he worked with Maddie, who is the navigator in this instance. Um, they also both get little pair programming icons next to their names over here. And Maddie's grayed out, because I can tell that they were logged in as Lucas, and Maddie was, was the one pair programming with their view. Um, so their answer is going to be under Lucas's account, um, not under Maddie's account. Uh, so we have that. Did you have a question from Teach Code? Can the teacher assign partners for collaborative work between students? So the question was whether the teacher can assign partners. And actually, yes, we totally expect you guys to be doing the assignments. Um, we don't, rather than try to do that all in the tool ahead of time, what we heard from teachers is it's something they like to do in the classroom. So they'll just, in the classroom, say, you know, pair up with your elbow buddy, or they'll move the students to the right place. And then when the students are sitting in the right place, the students are going to log in with their partners. Sure. And one of the important things that we heard is that you need the flexibility to change who students are partnering with day after day. So just because I work with Hadi today doesn't mean I want to work with Hadi tomorrow. Hadi yeah. might be. <laughs> Hottie might be sick tomorrow, um, or you know, I just want to switch up who's working with who. So there's nothing locked in. I can work with different students every single day, um, and the students will continue um, on whatever puzzles you want them to do. Whoever is the driver, um, their account, the person who logs in on their account, that's the one where that's where the students will start. They'll start with wherever that student left off. But if you want the students to redo puzzles they did the day before, now that they're working with their partner, that's fine too. That's up to you. Um, and so we just really wanted to give you guys the control to manage your classroom. Um, and this is about you guys being able to, to pick how you want your students to work together. And again, if you have questions, you can email at Teach Code, like somebody just did. Uh, next. Email or you mean? Oh, sorry. Tweet. 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 Thank you, Howdy. Tweet. That's why I need my navigator here to <laughs> help me out. Uh, stage extras. So another thing that we've heard from you guys about how the classroom is running um, is that you often have students who just zoom ahead. Um, and they finish the end of the stage, and they just zip right on to the next stage. Uh, and you would rather, when they finish the stage, um, you know, do something else that day. And sometimes it's something else on the computer, um, and sometimes it is something not on the computer at all. Like when they finish stage two, they're supposed to go journal. They're supposed to be writing. They're supposed to be practicing their handwriting um, and not going on to stage three. And so we wanted to give you guys the ability to have a little bit more um, uh, control over what's going on in your classroom. So uh, there's well, people also specifically asked for letting us lock down stages so kids can't go ahead. This is right. I mean, that's that's yeah. part of the request. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That one we don't have that yet, but we do have the piece of just a little bit more, um, like another sort of uh, a little bit more control over the flow. It's not complete control, uh, but it is a little bit more control. So when you set up your uh, classes, you'll now see there's this new uh, section called Stage Extras, and you can also change it for an existing course. So I can go into one of my existing courses, if you didn't already check this box, and say yes, save, um, and now this one has Stage Extras turned on. Now what Stage Extras does... What is the default for it? Is it default to on? Or it off? defaults to off right now because it's sort of in beta, we're trying it out. Um, but if, uh, you know, if we get a lot of feedback, and we're going to continue to improve it, um, I want to let you guys know about it so you can try it out now. But if you, you know, if we find out that a lot of people are using it and you want it to default to on, we could switch the default to on. We were thinking that once we added 
more features and made it more, you know, added more stuff to it, we would probably start defaulting to on. Um, right now, it still defaults to on. So let's say I'm doing this stage on functions, and I get to the last level in the stage. I'm just going to skip ahead here. Um, create a function to, what did it say? Turn, move forward, make three honey, and then return the beta where it started. Turn. Now, that's going to take a little while. Let's do an easier one. <laughs> um, I'm going to go back one. OK, I need to pick the correct block to draw this image using the given functions. OK, so I'm going to pick this one. I hit submit. Um, and instead of moving me on to the next level, when you have stage extras turned on, it's going to pop up this little extra dialog that says, congratulations, you finished the stage. Um, and then it's going to say, ask your teacher what to do next. Um, so hopefully they ask you. Uh, but if they don't, we also, you know, you can help them say, you know, go practice your handwriting. Or you can say to them, you know, you should try doing a new drawing if we have a new app. Or they can open a project they've already worked on um, and do more with that project. And uh, these are basically just exploratory spaces where they can just build something that's interesting to them. They can, with the app, they can build a story. Um, they can build, you know, characters moving around, a simple little game where things kind of shoot at each other. Um, with the drawing, they can build a creative drawing, whatever they want. Um, but these are just sort of play spaces for the students. And this is really designed um, to be used in courses two, three, and four. Um, where it's not designed yet for the pre-readers. Um, these are the new drawing and new app tools aren't, aren't really at the level of course one. So I'd recommend it for courses two, three, and four. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the richer controls. So those are some of the things we've given you to improve your ability to manage your classroom. Um, we're also doing things for students to make you know, their experience better. Um, two in particular that I wanted to call out. One is related to what I just showed you. So um, when the students do choose new app here, what they're going to go to is our play lab area. And I've got an um, example little play lab app here that a student could make. Um, and we've been doing some things to make this uh, space more interesting for the students so that they can play more and do more interesting things. Um, in particular, we just added an ask block. So um, this lets them make things that are interactive. Um, and this could be a choose your own adventure story, or it could be using numbers to affect what's happening. I wrote this simple little app. Let me reset and run it for you. Um, I've got my little witch. She's going to come down. How high should she fly? Hottie, how high should my witch fly? Uh, I don't know. How many pixels? Would, like, I'll say 200. 200 pixels high. OK. Let's submit it. She's going to go up 200 pixels and say she's flying, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which is you know, exciting. Uh, but it, I think the, the thing is that they can make things that are interactive. Um, it makes variables a lot more interesting, uh, because when a variable is predefined by the code, it's less of a variable. Um, and this way, um, it's a better way to teach variables, because they can, you know, Change. They could change which variables should do. Variables should be variable. Um, so that is that's a um, example of one of the ways we're making this space better. We're continuing to do other things here, um, but I thought that one was worth calling out. We don't have puzzles or activities yet that push you to use this new block yet, but it's um, just available now. But we're going to be adding those. Yeah, we're going to add some puzzles that use it. Right now, it's just available in PlayLab, and we're going to make some puzzles that build it into the into the design of the puzzle. Yeah, there's lots of fun activities you could do with it. So for example, yeah. you can make like a Mad Lib story where you know the, the little witch or character can say, say an adjective or say a verb or say a noun. And then it can read back a story that combines those things. Or, or you know, lots of things it like that. Can't do that one yet. It can't because the strings. Because we need to put the string join block well, let's, in. Let's but we're adding the string join block very soon. So we will. And if you guys have other suggestions, feel free to email us. Like, Let us know what you think we should be doing. Um, or tweet us. Uh, the next thing we did was we added this unused code block. So um, one of the things that we saw was the students would write a lot of code and then just want to test it with part of their code or they're moving their code around. And I don't want to throw it away because I spent a lot of time on this. Um, so. You know, I kind of want to drag it off, um, but I want to keep it here. And we wanted to make it really clear which code was running and which code wasn't running. Um, it can be really confusing. We also see scenarios where if the code isn't attached, the student has no idea why their code isn't working. So for example, let's say I took my whole area and I just put it here. It's not attached to the when run block. Nothing's going to happen when this code runs. But it's not necessarily obvious, especially to a beginning student, that nothing's going to happen when I hit run. 
So what we did was we added this nice little... It used to also give you an error when you have unattached code. It would just say... It would say there's unattached code. You have unattached yeah. code. Which, um, doesn't, which doesn't. wasn't great. So now what we do is instead of giving you an error, we gray it out a little bit. We do a little bit of uh, sort of an alpha on it so you can... It looks less like it's going to run. Um, and then when I hit run... So let me take some of this off of here. So it's a little bit grayed out while I'm working. And then when I hit run... Um, the unused code gets highlighted with a little box um, that shows that it's unused code. So now I know that this code is sitting here unused. Um, but it also means that I can keep it around. Um, so if I do want to use it later or just hold on to it, um, it makes it easier for students to sort of play around as they're working um, and try out different things. OK, so that was a little bit about what we were doing for students. Um, we've also been improving our puzzles. Um, and you know, there was a ton of work that went into course four, improving hints, improving a whole bunch of different things. But I wanted to show you a couple of the, new, of the ways in which our puzzles are improved. Um, and this is across the board, you know, not just in course four. So the first thing we've done is we've added a lot of hints. Um, and we've also added a new UI for hints. And this came in late last year, so some of you may have already seen this. Um, but for those of you who haven't noticed it, I wanted to point it out. Um, we wanted to, again, some of you said you wanted more challenging puzzles for your students, uh, but at the same time, we want to support students who maybe aren't ready for those more challenging puzzles. So being able to differentiate more um, and offer puzzles that were harder to begin with, but then enough hints that all the students could eventually get there. So there's a new hint UI over here. You can see it um, on some levels. You get a little light bulb next to your guy. So this little artist guy has a little light bulb next to him with six. That means there's six hints on this level. So I picked it with a lot of hints. It's very hard. Um, but I can click that. I'll see all the instructions again. And I can choose to get a new hint. Um, and it's telling me a little bit. You know, this is a visual hint. This one's a graphical one. Um, and it's giving me a sense of if I wanted to make this, how would it look like while it's getting made? And that definitely helps. Um, but maybe that's not enough for me. And I want more. So I can click again. Um, and I can review all of my existing hints and get another hint. Um, in this case, this is a series of octagons with sides that are counter pixels long. Um, so I can get more and more hints and go through it. Um, I wanted to point these out just so you know they're available. Um, and if your students are having trouble, um, one of the things you can encourage them to do is if there is a little light bulb on that level, click on the light bulb to get the hint for that level. Another thing we've done um, to make the puzzles more interesting is we now have some puzzles that will have limited number of blocks. And you'll see these in a few places. Um, one of the places you'll see it is in course two um, when we're teaching the maze. What we want to do is get the student to try to learn how to use a repeat block. And we used to do this by saying they had to use the repeat block. But that was too specific. It's like, hey, you didn't use the repeat block. Yeah, it was annoying. You'd get yeah. to the pig and they're like, yeah, you got it, but you didn't use the repeat block. So right. it's not good enough. Yeah, you, you put five move forwards and you feel like you solved it, but it wasn't solved the right way, and that's that's not the feeling we want the students to have. So well, the, the worst part is the pig would complain, and you know, I mean, basically, it looks like you got it, right? Except we just penalize you and say it, it wasn't good enough. But my bird totally got that pig, so, <laughs> so I should totally get credit for passing it. So now there is no way to pass this level without using the repeat block. I've got an infinite number of turn left blocks. I could turn left all day round and just turn in circles. Um, but what you see here is this little one next to the move forward. That means I only get one move forward block. Um, and when I use it, I now have zero move forwards left, and it's a little bit grayed out. Um, and so while I can turn right and turn left as much as I want, with only one move forward block, the only way I'm ever going to solve this puzzle is by figuring out to use the repeat block with my move forward block. And now, well, now I'm going to turn around and hit a wall. So that's not going to help me at all either. I really need to, I could turn left one more time and that would be brilliant, but, uh, uh, and my angry bird thinks I need to keep coding. So, yes, I do, I do need to keep coding. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to show you the new limited number of blocks um, and that, you'll see how that on various levels, especially when we're trying to teach something like loops where we're trying to show you how you can do it with fewer blocks. Uh, the next thing, did oh. Remember, did you remember him? We did. We showed them. Does it keep track of how many hints they need? How many hints they've used or how many hints they How many hints they need? I yeah, the same thing. Just yeah, so we are collecting basically every time you click to get hint, we count how many times a student uses a hint. We don't have any user interface yet to show that back. So, so as a teacher, you can't see that, oh, you know, Sally used seven hints, but Mary used only three hints or so on. 
but we're collecting that data uh, and we'll be we'll, we're, we're planning on basically finding ways to do intelligent things based on that um so if that makes sense so, so yeah. we, we understand and we at least keep track of how many hints a, a student needed to use before they get the solution um we're, we're working on what's the best way of basically fe featuring that back in terms of the dashboard uh, just because we don't want to make the dashboard uh, too confusing so i think we can go into a little bit more detail about how we're planning using it but uh, but it's still sort of a work in progress for us. Working on it. Yeah, we can uh, we could say that there's time at the end. We can talk more about that one. Uh, so the last one of these is not part of CS fundamentals. But again, some of you have told us that your students are ready for something more. Um, I'm particularly talking to you know fifth grade, sixth grade teachers, people using the accelerated course for CS fundamentals right now, maybe in middle school. Um, if you and your students are ready to go further, uh, we just made a change to our privacy policy such that App Lab is now available to middle school classrooms. Um, what I mean by that is anybody under age 13. So if you have a nine-year-old who's ready to go for this, by all means, go for it. It's available um, for elementary school classes. It's too. available for elementary school. It's available for everyone. It's probably, I'll show it to you. Um, it is it is a tool for, um, we, you know, we think a middle school classroom is probably the right age, but, you know, you have advanced fifth, fourth graders. Um, you can go ahead and check it out. So this is... Um, our new tool, we've been using it in our high school class for CS Principles. If you go to App Lab, you can see it. Um, and on this page, we've got a bunch of tools to help you get started. Um, if you're just trying to figure out what it's all about, you can um, watch our little video here. Um, we have a course for high school students um, to introduce it. Um, and there's also a bunch of short demo videos that'll show you how to make an app using it. Um, and then there's some sample apps you can use to get started. Um, now this is a tool, it's a real programming tool, students can make um, web apps, and these can get quite complicated. They can use a database, they can use servers, they can, they can do really interesting things, um, but it's also very easy to get started. Um, and for students who want to, you know, who are more comfortable with blocks, or maybe they're not typing as quickly, um, it allows you to use type blocks, but it is sort of more real code in that it's using real JavaScript. And the code inside the blocks here is actually JavaScript, and they can switch back and forth um, between a text mode where they're typing the code um, and a block mode where they're dragging and dropping blocks. If any of you did the Star Wars tutorial we um, had for Hour of Code last year with JavaScript, it used the same technology to switch back and forth between blocks and text. Um, it also makes it easy to get started creating your own apps because we have a, a design mode where the students can drag and drop buttons and images and other items right onto the screen and then hook those up. I'm not going to go into detail on no, this tool. Yeah. Because this is the CS Fundamentals. Now, let me make a new app. <laughs> <laughs> super easy. CS Fundamentals demo. No, but, but you can make new apps so quickly and so easily that it's worth showing. Okay. So I just click Create New to make a new app. And I'm going to go into Design Mode. And I'm going to drag a text box here. It's going to say, Enter a Number. And a button here that says, Draw. This will be extremely simple as an app. And then I'm going to change the screen background to be some fun color. Okay, that's not fun. That's okay. not fun. Blue. Blue is better. Or whatever. Um, and then, so then the question is, what is this code going to do? So when we go into code mode, uh, we can decide what happens when the draw button gets clicked. So first we need to say on event. So when this button gets clicked, what should we do? But we need to know what number you typed in here. And so to do that, uh, we need to create a variable. Let's call it x. And x is going to get the value that is in that control. So we need to get, get the text. We can say x is the get text from the text input. So when this event gets clicked, the variable x will get the number that's over in there. And then I'm just going to move forward that many steps. I'm going to say move forward however many pixels I want, but instead of 25 pixels, I'll move forward X pixels. Uh, actually, now we can just say after that, we can turn right. And I'll turn right 90 degrees every time. Uh, so that's the, that's the app, and you can run it. And so I'm going to enter the number 5, and we're going to move forward 5 pixels and turn right. And then I'm going to enter the number 20. I'll move forward 20 pixels. I move forward 100, and I move 100 pixels, and I move forward 30, 30 pixels, and I move forward 200, whatever, 290. Anyway, 
not a very complicated app, but what's cool about this is now you can share this and use this on your phone. And you can also uh, switch this these blocks into text mode. And this is basically the JavaScript code for that app. And you can type in JavaScript and then switch it back to blocks. Uh, there's a lot, lot more you can do, but that was an extremely simple app that I built in two minutes. And that's what's cool about that app. Cool. Um, so yeah. Uh, and now that's all stuff that's available. You can use it right now. It's ready for back to school. Um, and we're going to show you now some of the things that are coming up. So Ryan, can you want to share your screen? Yeah. So Ryan's not going to show the stuff that's not available yet, but you can turn it on if you want to experiment. Yes. So um, we have a couple of new features that uh, you can actually try uh, yourself. I'm sorry. I meant to. Uh, try yourself or with your students. Um, but they're not quite totally done yet, so we're going to give you sort of a sneak peek of them. Um, and these are in response to some of the feedback that we've heard about uh, how students use Code Studio and some of the things that could help them solve puzzles a little bit better. So uh, the screen that you see is probably pretty familiar to you if you've used Code Studio in your class before. Uh, this is a puzzle from Course 1 uh, with some instructions for the B. So we always start with this pop-up that has some instructions inside. Uh, and once I click OK, my instructions get very small down here if I happen to realize that they're there. Um, and I can get them back in this dialog if I want to by clicking on it. But uh, it can be kind of hard to see my instructions and my code at the same time. Uh, along with that, if I am sort of working toward a solution, but it's going to take me a little while to get there because I want to write a little bit of code, test it, write a little bit more code, test that. Um, every time I hit run, I get this sad face uh, pop-up that blocks my code and tells me that I didn't get it quite right. Um, and maybe I knew that, and I was just trying to iterate to a solution, which is actually a good thing. And that's something that we want kids to uh, try to do, is to build their solutions progressively and experiment with their code. Um, and then I can't see that feedback alongside the code that uh, I wrote. So I wonder, oh, wait, what, what was the B telling me? What did I have to do? Uh, so we tried to address some of this feedback by. But what ends up happening is kids just get learned. They just learn every time the pop up comes to just hit the X yeah. to get rid of it, yeah. whether it's the instructions or it's the, whether it's the feedback because it gets them away from the coding. Oh, and then they raise their hand, Mr. Sloan, what am I supposed to do on this level? Because <laughs> they forgot. Yes. Um, so uh, what we did is we designed uh, a new uh, instruction panel that appears up here above my code. Um, and it is also going to update while I run my code. So before, when I would hit run and I didn't get it quite right, I would get that big pop-up. Um, now I get some feedback and help that pops up in this panel up here. Um, so it's telling me I should try a different block. Uh, I will write some more code. And as I try different solutions and work toward uh, the right answer, I'll get different kinds of feedback that pop up here next to me um, as the B. And I actually can also get things like my hints up here. So earlier, Alice was showing you that uh, we now have this hint light bulb that appears next to the character sometimes down by the instructions. We've integrated this uh, hint experience with this top area as well, so that now I can see my hints and review my hints while I work on my code. So if I click on my hint uh, and say I want a new one, I can now view my hints and my instructions and all of that up here at the top all together. Um, and so what this does is it makes it a little easier for me to review all the information that I have and my code at the same time and maybe write code little by little without getting a big sad pop-up. Um, Since it all scrolled off, is there any way to look at all of it? Um, yes, so you can either you can scroll uh, with your scroll bar or the buttons, or if you uh, want to, you can see that there's these little dots here, and you get the, the arrow when you hover over it. You can actually resize it to make it as big as you want. Um, so if you have a large hint in there, maybe there's an, a picture hint like Alice showed on that earlier puzzle, um, you can resize it to make it as big or as small as you want. Um, if you just want to kind of minimize it and get rid of most of the information and only see the basics, you can hit this little less button, uh, and that'll shrink it down to as small as it can be. So this is uh, actually out there, and you can try it uh, in your classes or on your own if you'd like to. Um, we can tweet the experiment. 
address? Yeah. We'll tweet out some instructions for how you can uh, try it on your own uh, if you want to. Teach code. So yeah. Teach code. Teach code. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, one other well, new feature. The reason we haven't rolled this out yet, by the way, is because we know that kids in general ignore the instructions, and these instructions up at the top. Unless kids know that that's where they're happening, their eye doesn't notice it as well. So we're lo looking at this, doing something in the interface to sort of the very, very first time draw your attention that the B up there is telling you stuff. Uh, because if you don't even know it's there, you can just completely ignore it. So yeah. you know, if the pop-ups were too in your face, this is now a little bit too unnoticeable. I mean, just find the right balance in between. Yeah, find somewhere in the middle uh, that will be happy. So the other feature that I'm going to show you uh, is currently only available in course one, um, but it's designed for some of our pre-reader students. Uh, so some of the feedback that we got is uh, in course one, we uh, say that it's designed for early readers and for pre-readers, uh, but sometimes you still have to read the instructions to solve the puzzle, um, and that can be an unnecessary stumbling block for students who are still learning to read, or students for whom English is a second language, um, or all kinds of things like that. And so uh, we're exploring adding some new uh, tools to course one that will allow students to play out instructions uh, in text-to-speech. Uh, so right now, we have this orange button that you can turn on uh, with a, a special flag that we can also share after the uh, webinar. Uh, we're going to change the way that this is designed to look a little different, but um, you'll get sort of the early preview of what it looks like. Well, right, right now, you need to click to listen to the instructions. It's going to soon be automatic. So it just reads out the instructions if you choose to make it that way. Right. Yeah. If you turn it on, it will just automatically read instructions as you go to each level. Um, and what I get right now is this play button, which I'm realizing no one will be able to hear. Can you turn up your volume? I, I can, can but then I'll get the... Get two nectar and then make two honey. <laughs> what can I do? That's what it will do. Yeah. Um, if you turn up your volume, though, well, good. then it will play my voice from the. Oh, that's okay. I think. Thing. So. Yeah. Uh, we'll tweet We'll tweet it out so you can try it yourself. Yeah. I don't want to get feedback on the call, so I'm not going to try it here. But just take my word for it when I say that if I press play, um, you will hear the computer read the instructions out. Um, but you'll be able to try it yourself. This is available in all the puzzles in course one. Um, this is also hidden behind a new feature flag, but uh, we'll tell you how to turn it on and turn it off if you'd like to use it with your class. When we do turn it on for real, it will be a little bit more little kid friendly. Like right now, there are five buttons on the screen. Um, we will not have five buttons on the screen. There will be one big button with a microphone, and you'll hit it, and it will play. Um, <laughs> so the kids won't be able to like adjust and rewind and fast forward. Um, that's why it's behind the flag right now. It's just we wanted to give you early insights what we're developing. Right. Also, we want to get to the point where either you always want your instructions read out loud or you never do. Right. And if you always want them read out loud, you shouldn't even need to click anything. It just reads them. Yeah, so. exactly. Um, also, um, we keep saying teach code. But if you follow teach code, other features that we're developing, we put them behind these flags. And we share them um, on our blog and edit teach code um, with teachers who want to see what we're working on. Um, and if you want to try anything before we ship it, uh, that's the way to follow us along and try it. Um, and we love to get feedback from early, early users. So if you want to try something early and tell us what's working and what's not, um, you can help us make it work better for your classroom. So really appreciate all the feedback we get on those features. Okay. Uh, so we got some questions, it looks like. Um, so here are, oh, look at this. Daddy wrote them down for us. OK, so I got, I got a series of questions that I'm going to read from you guys. So question one, um, how do I get my school to buy into CS? Yeah, I guess I'll take that question. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different ways, uh, but we one thing we've done to, I mean, uh, to make this as easy as possible is we've made a default PowerPoint that people can use. Uh, can you screen share from your computer so I can show how people can find it? Let me do that. Uh, yeah, sure, either one of you. So, you know, increasingly more and more educators realize. Uh, are you screen sharing now already? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, if you go to code.org, uh, the page that has stats has a whole bunch of other valuable stuff. Uh, and this is the page for basically promoting computer science. One thing it has is down here tools to help you advocate locally. And this PowerPoint here, which is about why computer science in K-12, 
is an incredibly valuable resource that basically talks about how not only those jobs in computer science, but it's foundational and it teaches critical thinking and more parents want it and the president says everybody should study it and th those types of things. All of the best sort of selling points of why teaching computer science are over here. Uh, and Maddie, if you could actually just find the link to this and tweet it out, it would be uh, helpful. So forever, anybody who's listening, in terms of helping convince the school to embrace computer science, this also here is a letter that a teacher can send to their principal. Uh, you know, it just has the text that, that we use to recommend. Um, but this PowerPoint is really, really compelling. Uh, most of the material in the PowerPoint is basically the PowerPoint version of these slides uh, that you see right above here that are on this sort of web page. Um, but it, it has them sort of nicely laid out in a PowerPoint with a bunch of narrative around it. Another thing is that um, if you know teachers who are interested, we have professional development workshops around the country that are free, they're one day long um, to get started. I know some of you have looked for them before and not found one in your area. Uh, we have added another 30 percent more uh, facilitators this summer. So we now have over 200 facilitators around the country who are offering these and in a lot of new regions. So if you've looked before and there's nothing in your region, try again because we've got a bunch more teachers um, offering these. Actually, while we're here, let me show how you find those also. Okay. Any of you who are a CS Fundamentals teacher uh, in elementary school and haven't gone to our professional development workshops, uh, if you click the teach page on code.org and choose elementary school, uh, this gives you an overall description of our elementary school program. But then this here button that says learn more and find a workshop, uh, there's way more uh, locations that have workshops available nationwide, uh, especially right now. So if you look at the whole map of the country, there's workshops in uh, almost every state and, and certainly in every major city. So yeah. if you haven't gone to one of our elementary school workshops, please, please check them out. Um, and the other thing you can do is organize an hour of code with your school. It's a great way to get people excited. So uh, Hour of Code's coming up. You can sign up now at hourofcode.com um, and organize it for your whole school, get people who haven't tried it before to get, you know, it's a great way to get people to try one hour, and then sometimes they want to do more after they try an hour. So um, if you register early right now, uh, you can get a packet with uh, posters of students to put up on your classroom. Um, so sign up. If you sign up now, it's a good time to sign up. Where do you sign up? Uh, ourofcode.com. I okay. Question two. I push for computer science with my second grade, but it's not in first grade. What course could I begin with? And that's from Margaret. Um, so Margaret, uh, if you're starting with second graders, um, I would recommend starting with course two. Uh, course one is the is really designed for pre-readers, but by second grade, your students can probably read well enough to do course two. Um, and course two is an entry point for students. It's a great entry point for um, students who can read. So start with course two. Question three. Um, <laughs> it's a super techie question. <laughs> um, so which framework and language uh, did you use to make Code Studio? This is the question. Oh, they can't see it. They can't see it. Yeah. Um, well, this is a technical question. I think it's the person's asking under the hood, what did we use to make Code Studio? Um, so the, the underlying framework and language we use is something called the, the language is Ruby and it's built up on a framework called Ruby on Rails uh, and this is you know there's many different languages you can use to build interactive websites uh, like Java like Python uh, but Ruby on Rails is certainly one of the most popular ones and that's the one we've used uh, then there's also the interactivity that's happening inside the page for dragging and dropping and so on uh, and that uh, we basically uh, started off with an open source component that, that Google built in a language called Blockly, uh, which is designed to you know, mimic you know, tools like Scratch. Uh, and the Blockly open source thing, we've, we've expanded on it quite a bit. Uh, but you know, Ruby on Rails on our back end and Blockly on the front end is the short answer to how we built Code Studio. Uh, yeah, so the next question, which Brian's getting a minute to get it ready. OK, skipping that one coming back because we're getting the demo ready. Uh, question five, can students with some coding experience use App Lab if they haven't done any of your courses? Uh, and you know, every student is different. I would say absolutely. If your students are already coding, um, for example, let's say you've got, you know, there's a couple of things you're going to want. You're going to want them to be able to type because it's you know, a typing thing. So if they're not comfortable typing, they can use the blocks, but you know, most of the students will do it. Um, it does require a computer. You can't you do it on an iPad. 
um, and does require some coding experience, but we have places to get started. When It also depends on the student's age and how sophisticated they are. When we teach App Lab in high schools, we start there. We start there with students who have absolutely no experience with any programming, um, and they start with App Lab. So well, probably what's most important, we didn't show this, but if you yeah. go to the App Lab page, yeah. there's an actual tutorial that you can go through that has stages and puzzles just like CS Fundamentals, uh, but instead of getting the bee to get to the honey or getting the bird to get to the pig, it involves you know little bits and pieces of App Lab to gradually teach you how to use App Lab. Um, yeah. That's different because unlike CS Fundamentals, it doesn't grade you when you get it right or wrong. It's designed for a slightly more mature student that then themselves can decide whether they got it right or wrong. But still, it's a step-by-step -step learning how to use App Lab. So a student who knows a little bit of coding, has done a little bit of CS Fundamentals, uh, but wants to jump straight into App Lab, I would recommend they go into those courses first, uh, right. rather than going to the whole tool and trying to sort out what's what. Yeah, absolutely. But it is a it is an introductory tool. So if you want to try it, um, and you have students who are ready for it, it doesn't. You know, I think it's more about the sophistication, age of the student, what they're willing to to work with. It's a more uh, it's a much more powerful tool um, than something like PlayLab and the K5 courses. You can build things that are much more sophisticated. Um, and if you have students who want to try that and have the you know sort of reading level and maturity to go for it, uh, I would say try it. See if it you know see if it works for your students. Um, so the next question is question four: um, How can teachers organize their student account sections to get ready for a new year on Code Studio without making new accounts? especially when getting ready for a new year on Code Studio. And before you answer that, Ryan, um, for anybody coming in late, um, if you want to ask a question, we are looking at, uh, if you just tweet them to at Teach Code, um, that's where we're looking for questions, so you can add to the questions. Uh, but yeah, how can teachers organize their students into sections for the school year? That's a good question. Uh, so we recently built a new feature uh, with the help of a volunteer contributor, actually, to help teachers solve this problem. So I have... Uh, so the different. problem is you have students from last year, and, and you want to organize them for next year. Yeah. So I have my Newport Newts from last school year, um, which are mostly fictional characters. But um, if it's now the new school year, and I want to move them to a different section, um, we now have this Move Students button that I can see from inside my Manage Students tab. So if I click on Move Students, I will see a list of my students. Uh, let's move Jane and Yoda. Uh, and I can choose to move them to one of my other sections. So all of these are sections that I've already created. So if uh, you're going to be working with the same students from last year, but maybe they're in different classes or different class times, or you want to reorganize them into new sections, you can use this to move them into a different section. But maybe Jane and Yoda are actually going to a new class next year, and they're going to be working with a new teacher. So this other browser is uh, my other account. And I created this new section that I'm going to use for my students. But I need to This means you're logged in now as a different teacher than, the, than Jane and Yoda's Yes. Friends. So I am, I am their teacher from next year. Um, and so if I look, I'll see there are no students in here. Um, but my section has this code here. Uh, it's six characters. And what I can do is I can send this to their teacher from last year uh, and say, uh, my section code for Jane and Yoda is C, D, Y, B, J, Z. And I can actually now move them into that section. So even though that section belongs to a different teacher, um, as long as I know what the section code is, I can move them over there. Um, I can move them or I can copy them. Uh, let's say I want to move them to be only in the new one. And then I click Move Students. So they're no longer visible here in my section. But if I go and put on my other teacher hat and refresh, you'll see I have two students here now. And if I click on Manage Students, uh, I have Jane Doe and Yoda. So this will hopefully help you as your students uh, maybe age up into a new grade. Uh, you can transfer their accounts to their new teacher. Uh, and you can also have their teachers from prior years transfer them to you. Or you can just move them within sections on your own account if you're teaching the same students as last year. Can the teacher, can the new teacher, if the students all have accounts from last year, can the new teacher just say, go to the section code URL and have them join that section? If the students log in with an email address, they can do that. 
So if your students log in with an email address, uh, you can send a, it's not on this one because this is not email, but you'll have a join link, which I can find. The bottom of my head. That's yeah, right. Can't that's scroll for some reason. Oh, that's weird. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it's right below. It's right below the. If, if, if I could scroll, I could show you. There we go. Um, I have this join link. So if my account is set up so that students log in with their email address, um, I can give all my students this address, and if they go there, uh, they'll join my section automatically. Maddie, are there any new questions? Um, if you delete student accounts, does it delete their progress? Um, so if students log in with an email address, um, even if they are removed from your section, uh, they can still log in. So uh, they will still be able to log in and get their progress. If students log in with a um, picture password or a secret word, uh, they're only able to log in as long as they're in your section, but uh, you can actually have students change their, you can have them change their account type at the end of the year uh, to an email address so that they can take their progress with them in the following year. Do you want to show how they can do that? Uh, yeah, show that. So, so in other words, if they log in with a picture password and you remove them from your section, their progress is gone, they can't see it anymore. Right. So if they want to keep their progress, they need to switch to an email address login so they can log in even when they're not in your section. Right. So uh, I can show you. I will log in as Han Solo. Ghost. So you're going to sign out and then log sign in out. as a student? Yes. So I'm going to log in as Han Solo, and he logs in with a picture password of a ghost. So right now, because uh, I log in with a picture password, the only way that I can get to my account is through that special section address that is associated with my teacher. But if I go, uh, if you word password, you can do it with picture. You used to be able to do that with picture password too. For security, because we could log in with each other. So this is a good example of you guys giving us feedback. Um, what we were just talking about was uh, we used to let anybody put an email address on an account. Uh, we don't do it anymore with picture passwords. They can't directly put their uh, email address into the account um, because we had students, uh, because the picture passwords are easy to guess, um, logging in as each other um, in a you know, section and um, a mischievous student going in and saying, I'm Ryan or I'm Luke and I'm just going to try all of it and figure out some way to log in and, um, and then putting my email address and stealing your account. Um, and so because that happened, we turned that off, um, which is what I was trying to do, but it doesn't work anymore. So now you as a teacher need to move everything over to be on the whole, so if you go to the, go to the whole section and edit the section to no longer be picture passwords, um, you can switch it to email passwords, or you can switch it to word passwords. Either one will let the student now add, um, so I can switch it to word passwords um, or email passwords at the end of the year. Um, and then let the student put an email address in. So now, now that he's using word passwords, um, there's a new drop down for my account. Um, and when he goes into his account, um, he can put in you know, a password at the end of the year that he can use to take it with him. Uh, if you don't think your student is, yeah, an email and password so that he can, so that even if you remove him from this section, he can keep using his account going forward by using that email to log in um, you know, next year or the year after at any point. Um, I know there are some teachers who the email is too hard for the students, so they've just left sections open from last year. Um, and you could like rename that to last year's section or something just to keep it out of your way um, so your students can still get in and use their old login to get into their accounts. But, but yeah, this is how the student is supposed to take their account with them beyond your class. Any other questions that we yeah, got, Maddie? One more. Uh, Darren's asking, how many days and lessons are there in courses three and course four? I teach one hour a week. Each of the courses one, two, three, and four has roughly 20 lessons. So it's for 20 days, which can be spread out. You know, that, that could be done, if you did them one hour a day, it would be four weeks worth. Uh, or you could do it one day a week, uh, and it would go for a little bit more than half the year. Uh, 
that includes the unplugged lessons. Uh, and you know, a lot of teachers we know skip the unplugged lessons and they only do the puzzles. Uh, and the puzzles, each of the courses has about 10 hours worth of, 10 lessons worth of puzzles. But we really encourage teachers to try the unplugged ones as well. Uh, that, that requires a little bit more prep, uh, but they really are great for both engaging the kids without screen time and also helping transfer the learning from the computer to the, to the classroom and back. And most of the teachers do do um, similar, to, I can't remember what, which teacher's name you said that was, but um, most teachers do do it about once a week or you know during a, a set time. It's, most teachers don't do this all at once back to back. So that's typical, so it's about once a week or something that they would teach it. Great, uh, five minutes, I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so I think we can end. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it was great to have you and thank you for teaching this. Um, if you ever wanna reach us, uh, we're at Teach Code, um, and uh, you can always reach out to us there. And uh, you can also reach us by emailing support at code.org if you have any questions, concerns, bugs, um, anything we can help you work through. And please continue spreading the word about computer science, whether it's via code.org's courses or, or any other tools that you find that, that you like. Uh, you know, uh, the way the computer science movement is, is spreading and growing in schools is because teachers telling other teachers about the importance of teaching this. Uh, so if you meet teachers in other schools or other teachers in your school and other classes, uh, please encourage them to get involved in computer science, to check out code.org, and to attend our workshops for elementary school. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.